what is intermittent reinforcement in the context of a relationship with a narcissist? Today we're going to talk about breadcrumbing, which is a process that a lot of times you'll see early in relationships where someone is actively sort of just sending a text or a message here and there, just enough to kind of keep you hooked. But we're going to talk about how this is used by narcissists in long-term relationships and exactly what that looks like. Another term for breadcrumbing is called intermittent reinforcement. It's kind of like crumbs of affection and in the context of a toxic relationship. Intermittent reinforcement is when the narcissist offers rewards like affection, approval, and validation only some of the time. See, this keeps you hooked because you're always going for those crumbs of affection. You're always looking for that person that you initially connected with, the person you fell in love with or like with or whatever. And worse, when you don't get the crumbs of affection, you try harder. Narcissists use this to control you, is incredibly toxic, and it's not something that anyone should have to deal with. So you're intermittently experiencing both abuse and kindness and affection and validation. It really throws you for a loop. Does that sound familiar to you? It's whatever the narcissist needs to do to kind of keep you hooked. The narcissist by nature does the push and pull thing. That's when the narcissist will desperately want you one second and then the next second push you away. And it seems like the moment that they have you, you know, if they say, oh my God, I can't live without you. I don't know what I'm going to do. And you give in and you go, okay, okay, let's stay together. Within minutes, sometimes they're back on the same old track. So they want you, they get you, they push you away. It's an ongoing cycle. And then if they think you're kind of slipping away, they give you just a little bit more to keep you going. And then you spend the rest of the relationship always going for those breadcrumbs. So we're going to get into this a little bit. Trauma bonds happen in any toxic relationship. They tend to be kind of strengthened by inconsistent positive reinforcement or intermittent reinforcement. So what that means is that mostly things were difficult. Mostly things weren't great. But every now and then something awesome would happen or the narcissist would do something that would make you feel kind of good, kind of warm and fuzzy inside. And in an effort to obtain that again, you would stay around in the relationship. In the beginning, it probably happened more often than not. And as time went on over the 36 years y'all were together, the positive reinforcement most likely became further spaced out. So less of it per negative incident. Trauma bonds like this that occur in abusive relationships very often also occur in other situations such as hostage situations. And other types of abusive relationships. You might also call it Stockholm Syndrome. In any relationship or situation where you've got lots of incidents where you have a lot of pain and these are sort of interspersed with times where you have less pain or even some pleasure. Some people say it's like a heroin addiction. So basically look at it like this. Trauma bonding is very much like drug addiction. In the same way that your brain becomes addicted to drugs, your brain becomes addicted to that person. And that's because during the time that you are with that person, it's sort of like Stockholm Syndrome, right? You develop a certain dependence with them, a codependence. And then what happens is that your brain sort of gets rewired. The way the neurotransmitters work changes, right? The, your neural pathways change. So when you are in a toxic relationship, you go in these, these big ups and big downs, and the ups and downs cause this. When you go up, because of a fight, an argument, whatever, you have adrenaline rush, adrenaline rush, stress, 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 cortisol. Then when you come down, you have a rush of dopamine and other feel-good hormones, chemicals, and that leads you to need to argue in order to actually feel good or need you to have stress and drama in order to actually feel good, which makes you crave that person because if that person is the only person who causes you to feel that kind of way, there it is. So since the relationship seems so promising at the beginning and as you stick through it, you know, it promises all these amazing things, but apparently heroin also promises an amazing Hi, but the thing is, while both of those kind of give a feeling of utopia, at least for a brief period of time, they also sort of suck your soul out and, uh, you know, in the process. But if you are struggling, another thing you might be thinking about is the possibility of having adrenal burnout. Well, the same area of the brain is affected by abuse, believe it or not. And so what happens is that because your body becomes used to the ups and the downs of the ups and the downs, you no longer can function like a normal person where you're emitting the dopamine that you need to feel good. That might be another component to this 
factor. All of these are wrapped up in trauma bonding though. Being with a narcissist, you go through the love bombing phase, then you go through the devalue phase and the discard phase, and then it circles right back around to love bombing or hoovering, depending on whether or not they actually discarded you or they just mentally and emotionally discarded you and stayed in the relationship. Because of their typical cycle, they tend to want to kind of reinsinuate themselves back into your life. But there's also another aspect here, one that maybe you haven't considered yet. And that is that the narcissist in some ways is both the drug and the addict. This part is important. The biggest reason we put up with it is because we are addicted to the narcissist and what they do to us on some level. In other words, when it comes to being in a relationship with a narcissist, you become the addictive substance as well as the addict. Yeah, that's right. So you develop a trauma bond with the narcissist and they get their own sort of drug of choice from you, which is narcissistic supply. And this is why it's so common for narcissists and sensitive broken people to get involved. Most of us have experienced some kind of trauma that eventually makes us people pleasers, to put it mildly. And that's because a lot of times we learned that putting our own needs aside in favor of keeping the narcissist happy was the only only way to stay safe. So let's talk about trauma bonding. What is that? Well, to put it really briefly, trauma bonding is sort of like Stockholm syndrome. Now in the context of a toxic relationship with a narcissist, it's a condition that causes us to develop a psychological dependence on the narcissist, sort of as a survival strategy during all that stuff. And of course, the profound and sort of all encompassing way that trauma bonding affects our brain and the way that we function in our life. Well, that makes recovering from a toxic relationship just, it feels almost impossible, but it's certainly significantly more difficult this way. So I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, how is trauma bonding possibly like a drug? I mean, technically it's not the trauma bonding you're addicted to, but the way it makes you feel. And that's the thing. See, the narcissists, they keep you spinning. And these extreme highs and lows associated with narcissistic behavior, well, those can create possibly unintentional, but still existent patterns of intermittent reinforcement. And it is that type of manipulation that keeps you sort of scrolling rambling for those little crumbs of affection. You know, the one I'm talking about, right? You're always hoping that you're going to get back to what you thought was normal or the love bombing phase. But see these crumbs, they offer tiny glimpses into that person that you originally met. And so you can't really stop trying to do more to be better, to be enough. Is it addictive? Of course. In fact, the narcissistic abuse cycle, it could go on for months, years, or even decades. And yet you still stay. But why? Well, wait a minute, let's talk about narcissistic supply. See, that is the emotional energy that narcissists sort of suck out of you, sort of pull out of other people. Maybe it includes positive or negative attention. It can include admiration. It can include, in a pinch, the joy a narcissist finds in making you angry or making you sad or any sort of extreme emotional reaction they can get from you at all. They might also get narcissistic supply from other people, including children, spouses, other family members, coworkers, neighbors, and other people in their communities, even strangers. But they will always have one or more primary sources of narcissistic supply or a narcissistic harem of sorts. All of those would be made up of different sources of supply. But how is narcissistic supply similar to a drug? Well, narcissistic supply gives narcissists a big sense of validation, makes them feel like they're worth something. And in a lot of times it reinforces their very calculated false selves. They get a rush of sort of feel good neurotransmitters when they get that narcissistic supply. And then they feel like they might almost die if they've been deprived of it. So you would think that that would make them people pleasers, right? But you have to remember something, narcissists will take either positive or negative supply. Now that's kind of make you wonder, well, do narcissists like to hurt people? Do they want to hurt the people they claim to love? And if they do, why would they get a thrill out of making you scream at them or making you kind of go crazy a little bit, go nuts on them? Or why would they like to make you cry? That doesn't make sense to you, right? It seems nearly impossible, but that's how it is. And I get it, trust me. But here's the thing. It seems impossible for you only because you personally cannot imagine the idea of actually enjoying the act of hurting another person in any way, emotionally or otherwise, much less doing so on purpose. And because as someone with integrity, I'm guessing it's unfathomable to you that the narcissist isn't capable of accepting responsibility for their own actions. We tend to think that we can help them do better. We think that if we just change everything we are and focus everything we have on the narcissist, well, maybe then they will love us. And you know us and our pie in the sky ideas, right? Well, see, we have this crazy idea that the narcissist should just act like a normal person, <laughs> a normal human who learns and evolves. But unfortunately, since the narcissist typically does not have well-developed emotional and compassionate empathy, while well, they're often pulled in, 
by the sort of thrill of drama. And they feel like getting this emotional reaction from you, whether that's positive or negative, is proof of their ability to control or sort of own you in a way. That along with the chemical reactions their brains have when they get that little zing of successfully pushing you over the edge, well, that's what makes you so addictive to the narcissist, my friend. Now let's talk about trauma bonding and narcissistic supply. It's sort of like toxic relationship glue. Okay, here's the thing. As I'm pretty sure you've probably imagined by now, there's a whole big snowball effect thing going on here, at least in most narcissistic abuse situations. The trauma bonding, it leads you to sort of stick around and raise your so-called threshold for abuse. That's the point at which you think you can't handle it any longer, and that's just about the time that you'll find yourself being hoovered right back in by the narcissist who obviously wants to drain you of your energy again. Of course, that leads you to instinctively want to stay safe. And as you desperately seek validation, you keep trying to please and get validation from anyone and everyone around you. Well, if you're anything like me, this leads us to develop a habit of avoiding conflict and doing anything we can to keep the people around us happy. I'm familiar. When we end up in a relationship with a high conflict personality like a narcissist, we end up going to almost any length to please them. And this is true even when it hurts us to do so. But because of the ingrained need that we have, maybe thanks to childhood or some other trauma, to please people around us, including the people we love and often, and especially the narcissist, well, we give and we give and we give even to our own detriment. And by nature, the narcissist is quite happy to take advantage of all of this. They want to get their needs met and they don't care who it hurts in the process. And now thanks to that lack of compassionate and emotional empathy the narcissist has going on, and of course the fact that the narcissist doesn't quite see you as a real person but as more of an extension of themselves who isn't quite as important or worthy as they, well, there's no level to which they will not stoop and you have to remember that. So in other words, our trauma bonding leads us to seek approval and validation from the people closest to us and the narcissist will absolutely on every level exploit that to get their narcissistic supply needs met. Can you see where I'm going with this? Let's talk about addiction and narcissistic abuse. What are the connections here? Clearly the addiction factor is real, but how does narcissistic abuse resemble addiction? It doesn't make sense, does it? Let's look at it this way. When a drug addict is seeking their drug of choice, literally no one is safe. And what I mean by that is they will steal from their own mama to get what they need. Have you seen this before? Well, like a drug addict, when the narcissist needs their little unconditional validation fix or that little hit of narcissistic supply in which they are absolutely absolved of their responsibility for the situation in their own life, they always like that. Well, no one and nothing can be as important as the fact that they really need that fix right now. So they will take anything and everything from you without reservation, without remorse to get what they need. And this will of course begin with your self-worth, your sense of security, your sense of well-being, you name it, they want to take it from you. And this is partially to control you, of course. And often the narcissist needs to see you as that extension of self in order to feel good about themselves at all. Now I know, I know what you're thinking right about now, right? Something along the lines of, wait, what? Are we really addicted to those jerks? That's ridiculous. And could they really be addicted to us? I mean, they don't even seem to like us most of the time. So what are you talking about, crazy lady? Well, some version of that? Okay, I get it. But listen, sometimes the narcissist might actually seem to like you, right? Sometimes they throw out those little intermittent reinforcement crumbs, remember? Then moments later, seconds later, they might have serious disdain and contempt for you. But the truth is that we are addicted in part because we believe we can help them change and grow. And we keep trying for the most part because you and me, we're sort of those people. We're the people who do the right thing, or we try to. But what we all have to recognize is that a narcissist, they aren't capable of evolution. They don't change, or at least they won't change. They can't accept responsibility for even who they are because seeing themselves in a distorted mirror, they can't see it. Narcissists see themselves as sort of untouchable, better than everyone else. In fact, they generally see most other people not as individuals in their own right, but as I said, as simple extensions of themselves. So in order to maintain the facade of their false self, the narcissist needs to keep people around them who will enhance that overblown version of themselves. But when the narcissist extensions turn out to be whole real people with real thoughts and feelings. Well, they don't like it. They can't, or at least they won't accept or tolerate it because it threatens to knock them off that sort of self-constructed pedestal. That of course leads to the narcissist poking and pulling and whatever they can to get your attention or anyone else in their pattern as they seek additional attention, drama, and eventually 
they'll be looking for a new narcissistic supply. The bottom line is that both a narcissist and a drug addict always put their own needs first without fail when they're seeking their drug of choice. And without realizing it, many victims of narcissistic abuse become addicted to it as well, which makes the narcissist and their source of narcissistic supply, both the victim and the drug. So how do you deal with trauma bonding? Well, let's talk about it. One of the best and most important things you can do is focus on mindfulness. So stay in the moment in your body right here, right now. Don't imagine some crazy thing happening. Don't focus on what used to be. Focus on what is right now. Live in this moment. Remind yourself that you are living in truth now. You are no longer living with this false drama or this stress or this mess that was the narcissist. So don't hold on to what might happen or what could happen. See how you feel in this moment. And if you feel trapped or unloved, then it's time for you to focus on your self love and self respect. If you've been in a relationship with a narcissist for 36 years, chances are your self esteem is wrecked if it ever existed in that time. One of the biggest things you have to do is remember what's good about you and to kind of combine that with a positive vibration. I like to tell everybody every day, think of 10 things you're grateful for and three things you love about yourself when you wake up and when you go to bed. It starts the process, starts rolling you in the right direction away from the negativity. If you can focus on feeling good and feeling grateful, that can sort of help to reconnect those little things in your head. Long story short, gratitude, love, feelings like that, they can help you to regain the ability to sort of create your own dopamine so you can feel good in the process of healing. Number two, you gotta let go of the whole all or nothing thinking thing. The fact is that when you were with a narcissist, chances are that your brain worked in a certain kind of way because you needed to deal with how the narcissist functioned and keep the narcissist at bay or keep their, their anger and their temper at bay. Don't tell yourself things in absolutes. Don't say, I can never ever speak to the narcissist again if that's not something that you're, you're comfortable with. It's just like trying to lose weight when you're trying to tell yourself you can never eat chocolate again. Guess what the first thing you're gonna wanna do is in that situation, you're gonna wanna eat some chocolate. So keep that in mind. Next up, number three, make sure that you focus on decisions that are all about your own self care and nothing else. My point is, Obviously, in a relationship like that, you spent a great deal of your time actually focusing on the narcissist's care and what the narcissist wanted and needed. Well, now I want you to start focusing on your own care and what you want and need. That's going to help a lot toward bringing you into the self-love space that you need to be in in order to heal properly. Remind yourself that you're just a work in process, a work in progress, and changes are going to happen as they happen and it's okay. You're okay who you are right now in this moment. Love yourself as who you are in this moment. And the rest of it's going to get a lot easier. I like to call it unconditional self-acceptance. The same sort of acceptance that you would give your children or someone else that you care about in your life. Number four, start feeling your emotions again. Give yourself a chance to actually stop and let your emotions happen. If you've been in a relationship as long as you have, chances are that you've learned to shove them down a little bit because it's easier not to have to deal with them when you're dealing with a narcissist. Well, now that you're out of there, it's time for you to actually let those things happen to you. Let those feelings come, feel them, and examine them, and work through them. It's a new thing. Journaling is a big help with this. You're gonna have to grieve as you go through this. Letting go of a toxic relationship is just as painful as letting go of any other kind of relationship, and in fact, Divorce is statistically more difficult for us as we go forward to heal from than actual death. Next up, figure out exactly what it is that makes you so connected to this drama. What is it that makes this drama or this stress feel like home to you? It's normal to feel that way. You have to know it. When you've been in any situation for 36 years, you're going to have trouble adjusting afterward. Identify exactly what you're losing here. Maybe you don't even realize how much you're gaining by leaving this person because you're so focused on what you're not seeing anymore. Once you have identified that thing, you can actually start to grieve for it and for that part of your life. Next up, give yourself a list of deal breakers. What are the things that you personally will not tolerate in any future relationship. So you you know maybe for you you won't tolerate verbal abuse, you won't tolerate, you know, uh, someone who wants to move into your house within 2 weeks or whatever it is. Have that list even if you're not ready to be in another relationship yet. That list will save you so much trouble because it doesn't just apply to your romantic partners, it can also in many ways apply to everyone else in your life. And what's unfortunate is that when we find ourselves 
really connected to someone who is a narcissist, very often we look around and see a lot of other toxic people in our lives. So be prepared for that. Finally, it's just going to be about building your life back up, changing it, creating the life that you want, making new connections with people, reconnecting with people who you've lost contact with over the years as a result of being involved with a narcissist and basically finding out who you are now and who you want to be and starting to become that person. This is just a starting point, of course. All right, so how do you deal with your addiction to the narcissist? Well, ideally, obviously, you would move on, move away from them, go no contact with anyone who's actively abusing you, which means getting focused on planning your escape and working to execute the steps involved, the steps that you need to take to get out, right? And then, of course, you're going to want to block them on all forms of social media, on your phone, and anywhere else you can, and then you don't have to deal with them anymore. And then you can get to the business of healing yourself. But what do you do if you can't leave and you can't go no contact? Well, if you have kids or any type of ongoing legal business or anything else that you must deal with a narcissist for, you might not be able to go completely no contact just yet. So rather than willingly handing over your emotional energy and health to this soul sucking narcissist, well, this is when you go gray rock as in keeping your emotional energy to yourself and sort of being boring to the narcissist. Gray rock is going to help the narcissist learn that they won't get attention from you if they remain abusive, if they are disrespectful or whatever. So they're either going to ignore you or try to be nicer to you or more likely they're going to move on and try to find a new source of narcissistic supply and sometimes it works especially if you can stand to block them and to be very firm in your boundaries but often inevitably the narcissist will do anything they can to pull you back into the relationship they can't stand to see you at peace my friend and if you don't have a spine of steel you might end up falling for their manipulative tricks again this brings me to the question of the day and the question of the day is can you see how the narcissist and their source of supply can serve as both the drug and the addict in this situation. Share your thoughts, share your ideas, share your experiences in the comment section below and let's talk about it. As always, thank you so much for being a part of my day and a part of my life and hey, thanks for letting me be a part of yours. It really does mean a lot to me. Now before I go, make sure you take a look at the videos I'm going to leave for you right there and right there. And while you're here, hit that subscribe button right over there so we can stay connected and continue on this healing journey together. I'll see you soon.